All right, welcome to the live stream, everybody. I have no idea if anybody's gonna want to <laughs> ask questions, uh, but we participated in the tiny house package this year, and we had like, I don't know, 1,600 people buy the package. So we've got a lot of users of Home Performance Tiny Spaces out there. So this is the opportunity for all of the people who took that online course to kind of get some time one-on-one uh, -on -one with me. Sent the message out to a bunch of people on my email list and through our social media. I have serious doubts whether any of that stuff actually works nowadays. In fact, I'm thinking about giving up email altogether um, because it just gets, things get lost in the shuffle. So I hope that you can hear me. And I hope that uh, if you have questions, you'll go ahead and feel free to chime in. I'm just gonna talk, I'm gonna ramble a little bit for about 10, 15 minutes. Let some questions stack up if there are going to be any. Again, if there are no questions, it does not hurt my feelings. I do not believe in social media or email or taking time out of your um, busy day to, to do things that you don't find interesting. So if there aren't people who are have specific questions on how to control the invisible forces inside of tiny spaces, that's perfectly fine. In my opinion, there should be a lot more questions about how to do all that stuff because we've seen plenty of tiny houses, um, mostly at tiny house festivals. And the issue that you will find at those tiny house festivals that uh, you'll see right up here, that's our award for best tiny home from the Georgia Tiny Home Festival. Uh, and what's special about this house when we show it at festivals is that we actually live here. Most of the tiny houses that you're gonna see either on TV or at festivals are probably not lived in every night. They might be a backyard accessory. They might be a model that a builder is showing that they are offering to sell to people. Um, but I think that having a track record of someone or in our case, six someones sleeping in this house every night and cooking their meals in here is very, very important uh, because that's the only way that you're gonna know how it smells and feels and sounds inside of the house while it's being used because of course it might be perfect um, and perfectly quiet but of course the refrigerator is unplugged the air conditioner is uh it was on but then they unplugged it so that they could do a tour there's no dehumidifier running etc cetera, etc cetera. so you'll see kind of the sounds and then the smells of course sheets what do dirty sheets smell like when you the entire house is your bedroom and that's what I mainly am talking about when I'm talking about smells. It's not like really disgusting people. Like I sleep in a bed, my sheets start to stink after a couple of days a week. So you need to make sure to wash your sheets. You can hide that if you're in a big house. You can't hide it in a tiny house. And that's why we had people into this house for uh, every day of the week for 10 months in the Proof is Possible tour is to prove to people that you can have it all if you actually plan for it. And so what is running right now around me and I'm in the tiny lab right now, is the ductless mini split is running. That's a Mitsubishi. It's 33 sear. That's uh, over, th I mean, it's about three times as efficient as the minimum efficiency that you're gonna find in a normal home. It's very, very quiet. It's running on almost full speed on the fan. And that's for a reason that I'll talk about in a second. I also have the dehumidifier sitting right next to me. That's a, um, it's a desiccant dehumidifier. And that is um, for making sure that we maintain the dryness level that we want in here. It turns out that the air in here is, uh, does get humid, but it is not because of what we're doing in the house. It's because we're piping in air from outside. And even though I have an ERV, which is an enthalpy recovery ventilator, that's recovering, it's basically trying to make both the outgoing stream of stale air and the incoming stream of fresh air, the same temperature and the same relative humidity. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's super humid outside. We live in Atlanta. And um, right now it's, you know, 90% relative humidity outside. And inside I can track that and I want to make sure that it's always around, I mean, 60 max. I like it to be more like 50 or 40 if I can. And I can because I have a small amount of space and I have a machine that's right here that runs that for me. So the air is coming out right here. It goes in right here. Bingo. Nice and easy. It does drip into a little pan and I have to empty that. Where I empty that in the tiny house is into my Berkey. So we actually drink the water that comes out of the air uh, in this house. It's, I think it's a pretty cool, efficient system. That was Grace's idea. So uh, the refrigerator is also plugged in and it's running and you can't hear it. That is a sailboat 
technology that we are using over there. It's not one that's off the shelf at a home improvement store. It's not meant to be installed in homes. It's a sailboat model. So it's more insulation, quieter compressor, more efficient because it's made to be off grid plugged in. Uh, also our ventilation system is running. And so I've got uh, fresh air coming in through this chase right up there. It's coming out of that uh, register. And then it's also traveling down here if I want it to and coming out underneath in our under loft, which is where we sleep. Right now, I do not choose to do that. And, and that's because the air outside is very humid. And you, if you have seen a lot of these videos on the tiny lab, you may have heard me say this, but all of the soft stuff that is capable of absorbing water from the air and storing it in a material is in the underloft. So if it is very humid outside, I do not open that damper. All of the air is coming in from the uh, top there. Uh, I just got a question about homosexuality. Um, that's why you use the uh, top chat, not the live chat. So um, we're here to talk about home performance not homosexuality or any kind of sexuality. I'd rather not have that be the topic of conversation. So whoever you are, Haza, you can take a walk and go somewhere else. And I'm sure there's plenty of other streams that you can find on the internet about sex. Thank you for visiting. Uh, so that's all the things that are happening in the tiny lab right now, mechanically. Um, you can hear how quiet it is. I'm parked right next to the busiest airport in the world. That's the Atlanta airport. And so we're five minutes away from it. Luckily, the flight paths still go over the top of our house, but it does get a little bit loud in the neighborhood. And you'll find that this house is the quietest one in the entire neighborhood. And I will have anybody go to the map with me about that because it's so airtight. So airtightness, number one. Insulation number two, making sure that you have multiple layers. And that's actually something that we're going to talk about in our upcoming build of the 3,000 square foot house. So Grace and I and our two little girls and our two cats are going to be living in a 3,000 square foot house soon, which I'm excited about. Um, and the in order to control the noise there, and we have a music studio, actually, that's part of that structure. So within that music studio, I want to have multiple layers of different density materials. So we've got a layer of rock wool insulation on the outside. We have uh, OSB, that's Georgia Pacific Force Field, and that has several layers within it. And that's going to kind of like the, the sound comes in, it hits the metal on the outside, hits the air gap, hits the rock wool, hits the plywood, hits the more rock wool, and then hits the drywall, which might be double layered. And at that point, it becomes, uh, you know, a much more subdued noise from outside if we have to deal with any at all. And of course, it's here, it's uh, intermittent since it's planes. Uh, let me see if I can block this person. No, I can't, but that's okay. Uh, Haza, whatever your game is about Greeks and homosexualities, um, not into it. Uh, you're the only person to ask me questions right now, which is um, very interesting. So thank you for being here, but I'm not interested in having a conversation with you because that's not what this is about. So um, I am not against Greek people, or homosexuals, both of them are fine with me. Um, go have your conversation somewhere else. So as far as the invisible stuff that's happening in this house, we've got the way that it feels, sounds, smells. I explained the sound uh, just now. The way that it feels in here is perfectly comfortable. Like I said, I've got the fan running almost at top speed. And what that's doing is taking the air and pushing it along the ceiling. And you can see that my soffits for my lights here are only halfway down the ceiling. So the air is traveling and it's hitting the ceiling and it's hopefully doing what we call entraining. Now I don't have a test house like they have at University of Texas for home chem, but we want the air to kind of laminate to the ceiling and attach to it and then travel down, hit that wall and curve back around so that it can come down and into my under loft, which is the bed uh, area underneath where I'm uh, having you sit right now. And that keeps the temperatures throughout this place pretty even. So I'm, uh, we do have to run the fan at a certain level in order to make that happen, which is weird because if you think about uh, what is going on with stack effect, warm air rises, cool air sinks, you have the um, an impression that it would be cooler downstairs than it is upstairs, that it would, the warm air would be all upstairs. That's actually not the case since we've got the ductless mini split in the top here. It's uh, got all of the conditioning happening up top. And so it's actually uh, three to four degrees cooler unless we do this fan thing in the top 
uh, loft than in the under loft. So that's just something that you have to deal with. And by the way, everybody who has a tiny house on wheels, everybody who has a tiny space of any kind is uh, something that um, they have to deal with. And nobody talks about it, of course, on the television shows because it's not very much fun. So uh, that's the way that it feels. And by the way, the bathroom is interesting. Back there, we've got this door that's gonna close and that's called a, I uh, um, can't remember the name of the door, but it's a Japanese style door. I'll show you real quick. So you can see at the top of that door, there are a couple of vents. Those vents are uh, keeping the air, which is all the supply air is supplied here where I pointed out into the upper loft and into the under loft. And all of the exhaust air is leaving through that room. So right now I've just created a barrier and now the room on the other side of that door, which is the bathroom, is negatively pressurized. It's under suction. And this room is under pressure. It's getting air pushed into it. So all of the air that's going through those slots is going that way into the bathroom. So therefore, when you take a shower, for example, you want to make sure that it was closed because you don't want air coming this way, all the steam and everything like that that's created from the shower coming this way into the house. That's not a good idea. In fact, that's the job of the exhaust system in the bathroom, which is just the exhaust portion of the equalizing ventilator. Uh, so if I leave that door closed for a long time, that room heats up in the summertime, which is interesting because the mechanical shed that's on the other side of that wall, the, the front wall of the uh, house, is warm. It's very warm because it's got electrical components in there. It gets beat on by the sun at about four o'clock in the afternoon. And so that room is like 90 degrees, 100 degrees, maybe um, hotter than outside, probably. And so that room starts to get warmer and warmer. So we want to generally leave that door open unless there's a reason to prohibit the air from coming from the bathroom into the house, which it hardly ever does. But it's just like if, if it wants to and the temperature equalizes, that is a lot easier to do with the um, windows open. Wow, very interesting. So this is my first live stream, and I found out that we've got Trish Trolls. I don't know where these guys come from. Um, these might be machines, or they're Russian hackers who are being paid minimum wage to do this. Um, the only questions I'm getting right now are trolls. Um, so that's very interesting. You are a troll. Uh, so when I'm going to open this door back up and just make sure that the temperature equalizes, and we'll talk about the way that it smells. So the smell in the house is important and we uh, put a lot of pressure on it because we've got two cats. You can't see any of them right now. They're both on the bed. Um, the two cats mean that there's also a litter box in here. Guess where the litter box is, right? You would probably know that if you have taken the, the tour, but the litter box is in that room, which is where all the air is leaving from. Toilets in that room, it's a composting toilet. It's a lot of poop builds up over like a month. You reset the toilet every month or two. Also, I've got a bunch of booby diapers in there because we have two little girls now. So there's uh, four humans, two of whom are small, and two cats sleeping in here every night, and it smells fresh. Now, I will tell you, when the uh, dehumidifier fills up with water and it um, stops dehumidifying the space, when the humidity goes up in here, the smells get more... It's, it's interesting what happens because the D, the ductless mini split does not do a good job of dehumidifying. All of them do that. They have what's called a sensible latent split. This one is a 95%, 5% split. So 95% of the energy that goes into it lowers the temperature. Only 5% of the energy that's going through that coil actually dries out the air. So it's just not a good dehumidification source. There's ways to run the mode so that it gets drier, but it'll make your piece of equipment really mildewy. And you can see, um, uh, Oh, thank you very much, family fun for everyone. You're not a troll. Uh, so when that happens, then I have to clean that a lot more often. You can see that video on the YouTube channel as well, how to maintain the ductless mini split. So um, the feel, smell, sound is the main things that you're dealing with. Of course, also like light is important and we've got enough light in here. We have enough natural light. We have enough lights in the ceiling. Um, all of that stuff in general is stuff that really annoys me about tiny houses in um, as a rule, because I think that uh, there's a lot, not a lot of attention paid to the performance of those spaces. There's a lot of attention paid to what finishes are on them. What do they look like? What shape are they? Where is the bed? That was the main question that we got when we were on the tour was, oh, why'd you decide to put your bed down there and your dining loft up there? Um, that kind of stuff drives me nuts because it doesn't matter. It's totally personal preference. 
If it matters at all, it matters because the performance is easier to control the way that it's set up now. I wouldn't want to have cold air, like air conditioning, blowing on me while I'm sleeping. That would be terrible. So I like that my ductless mini split is not embedded in my bedroom. Uh, so another one of the interesting uh, questions that I've had is I had um, I have consulting clients around the world who are building tiny spaces, whether they're tiny houses on wheels, tiny houses on the ground, or vans. And one of my more interesting uh, clients who just kind of has me consult on an hourly basis every now and then when he gets stuck, he we get on the uh, Skype call and look at his thing. He's basically doing something that no one in the world probably has uh, done, or at least nobody has uh, overtly done. They might've done it in secret. So what he's got is a van and he wants to build a bachelor sleeping room in the back. There are no women involved. And so it doesn't need to be nice. It can have no windows. That's, that was a big one for me. I was like, okay, well, how many windows are you going to have in this place? None. Okay, now we can talk. Uh, how many skylights is going to have? Zero. Okay, good. What What do you want to do with air sealing? I want it to be super airtight. I want it to be ventilated. I want it to be humidified, et cetera. In that case, what's interesting about vans, if you're going to build like he's doing, which is the only way to have a truly well-controlled space inside of a van or a moving truck or a box truck or anything, is to build inside of it. You cannot use the walls of a vehicle to act like the walls of a house or any place that you'd want to live because it's made out of metal. Metal is very conductive. It's 400 times more conductive than wood is. So when you have a metal framed vehicle and you do something like spray foam everything, that's not a good idea um, for many reasons. The main one is that foam has fire retardants in it. And when you foam everything in a house or in a vehicle or full you know, little bubble around yourself, you are concentrating all of the flame retardants that are coming out of that foam for a long time into your face. And you will potentially have major health side effects as a result of that. Secondly, there's all kinds of stuff that's in the foam itself that is going to be, um, you know, happening. And that has to do with a home chem study. That's not me doing my own research. That's home chem, which is a Sloan foundation funded $50 million, 10 year study. Um, and there's all kinds of stuff that they're trying to find out. I personally am not using foam for anything probably ever again, uh, because I can, I can choose to use something different. So, um, in this case, he's using, uh, mineral wool insulation, uh, and some foam boards, but not continuously. There are some areas where it's not happening like that. And also we've got air barriers between him and the, the foam. And so if you're able to frame inboard, then you can build a fully framed with continuous insulation kind of a structure, which is how, why it needs to have no windows, basically. In that case, the weird thing about this um, setup, this system, is that the buffer space of the vehicles indoors, but outdoors of the box that you've built that you're going to condition and dehumidify is mysterious. We don't know what temperature it's going to be in there. We don't know what relative humidity it's going to be in there. So we need to protect against that because there might be condensation happening. So all of that is, is an, an interesting conundrum that we I've been dealing with with um, my clients in Europe. Uh, we've also had people in, uh, I have a client in Okinawa who wants to build a gigantic tiny house on wheels for his family. And there, and there we have some issues with road worthiness because if once you build bigger than I am, which is, this is a 24 foot trailer with an extra tongue on it, which is what contains all the mechanical systems. It's 30 feet tip to tail, two axles, each one rated for 7,000 pounds. If you have 14,000 pounds total, and you want to um, build a house that's going to be 14,000 and then you're going to add uh, furniture to it or a bed or anything like that or water. Now you have to app, add an axle. So three axles is very difficult to turn because what you're going to end up doing is parking your house and then you're going to need to back it up into a space and kind of like adjust it. And once you start doing this with a tiny house, backing it up and turning it on its wheels, it's going to be very hard on the axles. In fact, I had my house build up so much pressure one way where the tires look like they're bulging in two totally different directions that when I jacked it up, it manually adjusted itself once it got enough weight off the uh, tires that it could actually twist and it twisted right off the axles or excuse me, off the jack stands. 
So that kind of thing can be dangerous. And you want to think about all that when you're talking about tiny houses on wheels, that's a special, there's all kinds of special things you have to deal with maximum lane widths and maximum heights and stuff like that. That's why in general, I'm not a fan of tiny houses on wheels. I do live in one and I did build the highest performance one in the world, but, uh, that's just so everybody knows that I'm just not an advocate for tiny houses on wheels. There are too many limit limitations. Okay, let's see. I have a question from uh, Gabriella and Joshua. Do you feel decentralized ERVs do a good job for, uh, for example, the Lunos or the Twin Fresh from Home Depot? Hmm. I don't know the Twin Fresh, so I'm gonna not address that. But I I know that um, we'll talk about the Lunos and the Panasonic. Uh, spot ERV, which I think is called the Whisper Fresh. So decentralized ERVs. First of all, ERV, let's talk about what the, the words that Joshua and um, Gabriella are using. First of all, ERV stands for Enthalpy Recovery Ventilator. Just think of it as an equalizing ventilator that tries to make both streams of air the same temperature and humidity level. So Decentralized means that it is not hooked into your central duct system. In a regular house, we're talking about something that's not a house this size, but in a tiny space that's like, let's say a one bedroom apartment that's 500 square feet. Um, you have a duct system that's gonna be delivering air to the kitchen, to the bedroom that's behind a closed door, and then also to the living room and maybe to the bathroom, which is also behind a closed door. So you've got four ducts that are kind of spraying air equalized throughout the house. If you put your ERV supply into that system, it will already be distributed the way that you want, which is what a centralized system would do. Ours is a decentralized system, just like what Gabrielle and Joshua are talking about. So decentralized means that you are doing something that is not um, giving you equal distribution everywhere in the entire house. Here, I'm using that to my advantage. In this tiny space, and in any tiny space, which is what the topic of this live webinar is, and I'm, I'm going to answer your question for regular size houses as well, guys. But here, it serves me very well to have a pressurized end of the house and a depressurized end of the house so that the air all moves that way. That is how you can step into this house any day. And by the way, today I have not yet uh, changed the litter box. And this is 210 square feet. You would think you'd be able to smell that litter box being dirty. You can't unless you get down right next to it in the bathroom because there's an exhaust system right next to it. So all of the air is going that way. I like that. In a regular house, it's a lot harder to do. Let's just say if you have like two bedrooms, two sleeping quarters, you would want both of them to be pressurized with fresh air. And so now I have this weird thing where I'm delivering to two bedrooms, but not then to the kitchen. And so now I've pressurized and maybe I'm inducing these weird pressure imbalances that are going to have side effects more than what they would have in just a very simple shape like this. Now, the reason here and in any tiny space um, the Lunos is not a good idea is because the, the way the Lunos works is, and this is something you can get from 475 High Performance Building Supply, it's a European system. It's two fans, two holes in your wall. They're each four inches in diameter, I think. Each of them has a little fan and a little metal tube um, and that goes just through the wall, basically. And what they do is one of them blows and one of them sucks. So it's like a, it creates a tidal movement of fresh air through the house this way for 30 seconds. Then they talk to each other and they say, okay, switch. And they switch like this. And now this one's blowing out and this one's blowing in. And so they flip like that regularly all day long, forever. The problem with that in this case is that if I had the bathroom sometimes become pressurized and push air into my house, now I can't locate all the things I want to exhaust. Like for example, I, there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff about this, but I, I do not want that because I want all the air to leave from that room. The main reason I want air to leave from that room is because there's a shower in there and a toilet in there. I need to have a bath exhaust fan in every bathroom. This house is passive house airtight, which means that if I run a blower door test on this house, the blower door test number will be 50 CFM. That is the uh, leakage at 50. What that means is that I could flip that and say, if I blew 50 CFM out of this house, I would be doing a blower test. I would reach 50 pascals. That means I can't install a regular bath fan in this house because I would be doing a blower test. It's 50 CFM as a standard bath fan. So I cannot have a regular fan. I have to have this thing hooked onto the ERV 
So I have to be sucking on it with the ERV. Therefore, I must be pushing to make the air go that way because I don't ever want the air to come back out of there. So I hope that that kind of addresses that question for you. That's why the Lunas, in my opinion, not a good idea in a tiny house because you need your ERV, your equalizing ventilation system to be the bath exhaust. Otherwise, you have to have a separate makeup air, a hole in the wall of the bathroom, and that's going to be a nightmare to try and control. So um, that's why I think that in general, the Lunas is just not a good idea in, in tiny spaces because it's just not going to, um, it's going to mess with the pressures. And so now you have to have a separate spot exhaust, and that is going to lower the, like, let's just run through what happens. You run, you, you install the Lunas, which is a little tiny four inch fans, and then you install a 50 CFM fan. These things are going to run 20 CFM probably something like 20 or 40, right? I've got a 50 CFM fan, which is going to suck 50 CFM out of the house. Now, both of these things are supply. No matter which way the fan is intending to run, they're both going to be sucking in if I've got an airtight house. And it, if you don't know how airtight your house is, you can assume that you have no idea what's going to happen when you do these things. So um, let's see. Twin Fresh, I don't know. Panasonic, you can see my video on how to... Um, I, I wanted to affect that Panasonic because it, it basically exhausts from here in the plate and it supplies to here within the same room. And I did not want that because I wanted the air to circulate. That's very important is for fresh air to go everywhere in the house. So that's why I didn't use the Panasonic. I would imagine that whatever the twin fresh is, is something like that. Um, I'm not, I can't be an advocate for that because I know too much about how pressures and, and air flows work. Let's see. Hey, Neil, you made it. That's awesome. Thanks. Let's see. Wow. These guys are crazy. Okay, Andy is asking, would you put an airlock slash mudroom slash entryway in a larger floor plan? Do you see, do you lose a lot of control when people enter and exit? Would it be worth it? Very interesting. Um, I like the idea of an airlock. I think that's the most um, pertinent. So what I'd say is um, you need to ask yourself what matters to me? What is my goal? In this house, the goal is not to prohibit fresh air from coming in. Um, when I open the door, in fact, let me show you this real quick. I wonder if you can hear this. I don't know whether that read at all, but when you open the door fast to the house, you can hear the whole house go <gasps> like that. Uh, because you've just sucked on the house. It's, it reaches a, a pressure, and we could actually measure that pressure if we wanted to. Um, but there's one hole, which is always open, which is the exhaust over the stove. So when I close the door, the damper on that exhaust goes bang. And so you can always hear when somebody's coming in from the other side of the house, because that damper always lets you know. So that's kind of an interesting security system. Um, so I would not, I'm designing a 3,000 square foot house right now, and I do not have an airlock. I do have a mudroom in there because I want a place to be able to drop my filthy clothes because now I'm the kind of guy who works with an ax or a pickaxe outside in the dirt or like, you know, yanking poison ivy uh, from the shrubs and stuff like that. So yeah, I need a place where I can just drop my dirty clothes and muddy boots and stuff like that. So that's the main reason why I have that. I'd say that the airlock idea... It, um, it would be hard to do properly because now let's just take it as an example. Let's just have an airlock. Okay. You have um, your main body of your house, which has an enclosure. The home performance is only really dependent on two systems, the enclosure and the engines. The enclosure is the skin of the, of the house. That's the air sealing and air insulation layer. And then the engines are anything that move air or heat around within that or between it and outside. So, if you have an enclosure and then you add a little mini enclosure onto it for the purpose of making sure that you don't affect the enclosure when you come and go, it means that you would have a barrier to outside, a door that's going to be very well insulated on the airlock. And then you'd also have a door that's going to be airtight and potentially insulated on the house. So now I've created a, what's called a buffer space. Buffer space is supposed to be, well, most buffer spaces are like vented attics, vented crawl spaces garages. My mechanical shed is a, is a buffer space, for example. And you can see that if you haven't seen it, you can see it in the tour video, which um, go check that out after this video is over. That Those spaces are supposed to be the same temperature and relative humidity as outside. 
with the exception of no animals, precipitation, and wind. So they're, they're supposed to be slightly protected, but not really. Now I've created what is essentially a, um, a small condition enclosure that is connected with my main condition enclosure. So now do I have a separate, like if I'm really going to uh, prohibit this from having an effect on the main house, am I going to duct them together? Am I going to put a supply duct? In which case I'm also going to put a return duct in there. Now I have two ducts, which are to, you know potentially air pathways into the main body of the house. So I think that just like, you can hear that this is getting really into the weeds. So for me, I would say, no, don't worry about doing an airlock or something like that. If you wanted to have an outdoor space, like a covered patio or a porch that maybe you could do so that you don't spend a lot of time like putting on your shoes while you're sitting on your front stoop uh, with the door wide open that can eat it up. So I would say that, yeah, like keeping mosquitoes out is my main issue. And for that reason, we just open and close the door pretty fast. But when we do that, for sure, a little bit of air comes and goes, and that's not a problem because I actually replace all the air inside this house 24 times a day, about once an hour. All right. Uh, let's see. Wonderful. I'm glad that that helped. Uh, all right. Does anybody have questions that are not race mixing related? These guys are idiots. Can you guys see these comments? Um, uh, they want me to say stop race mixing, everybody. It's just, it's a, it's a huge problem. You know, this is actually, let's just go ahead and get on a soapbox for a second since I'm the one with the camera and these guys only have a keyboard. Um, I think it's so sad that everyone has to have an opinion about everything. I am an idiot sometimes. That's what everybody in all of my classes always says at the beginning. Sometimes I'm an idiot. It's okay to not know everything. You don't have to have an opinion about race mixing. You do not have to have an opinion about abortion or gun rights if you don't know anything about it. I'm not a gun guy. I don't care. Let's let the people who do have opinions about that stuff, who have personal contact with abortion, with gun rights, with gay marriage, like I don't care. So I don't have an opinion about it. It's okay. So for those of you who feel like, um, you know, you've got these uh, weird comments going on and you know who you are, you, mostly these two guys who are um, uh, total trolls, that just makes me sad. Like, also, just so you know, that's the, the man, if there is such a thing, or the Illuminati, trying to get you to distract yourself from what's going on in your own backyard. The reason that I do home performance is because there are plenty of families that have kids who are sick, probably because of something going on in the house. When you are paying attention to gay stuff or gun stuff or abortion stuff or race mixing, which by the way, I didn't even know was a problem until this um, troll is putting it on my feed. Uh, it's just distracting you from what's in your own house. There are things going on in, under your nose in your house that you are not aware of because you're paying attention to stuff going on around the world that has nothing to do with you. So please stop doing that and pay attention to what's going on at home. You need to protect your own family. No one is going to protect you for you. That's your job is to do that. And by the way, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you should check out Home Chem, the most recent videos on our uh, YouTube channel, because the stuff that's going on chemically we are all guinea pigs, basically, is what's going on. There is a giant experiment going on with chemicals, with uh, synthetic chemicals that people are trying to sell us, and we are all being experimented on right now. In this house, for example, we found out that I have all, all the wood you see behind me is formaldehyde-free because I did not want to have formaldehyde in my house. Guess what has formaldehyde in it, though? Wrinkle-resistant fabrics. Basically, every shirt I own has formaldehyde in it. And so now I've brought the formaldehyde into my house, even though I built it to be formaldehyde free, I brought stuff now inside. And we've got all these things like flame retardants and phthalates and bisphenols and antimicrobials and all this stuff that's not good for your family. So please stop talking about your ridiculous stuff and you guys go somewhere else. Um, okay, Gabriella and Joshua say, is there an economical way to build a healthy home based on thermal mass or natural means versus building stick frame with insulation and forced air systems? Okay, that's a great question. So the question is, is there a way to build um, a house that's going to be healthy and comfortable and sound good and smell good, high performance basically, without having active systems by just designing something that's going to be um, in the way of like an ecosystem, you just put it together, you put the frogs and the fish and the reeds and the plankton and the algae and the grasses and the sun all in the same place 
and then you just let go and it runs itself forever. That's a beautiful idea. I do not think that that works um, for one very big reason, which is global weirding. When you are building a house, in order to have performance happen, you have to have the same amount of heat added to the house as is subtracted from the house in the wintertime, and the same amount of heat taken out of the house as is added to the house in the summertime. In order to do that in a what you're calling a stick frame building with insulation and forced air systems, we do a couple of things. We do an energy model to find out how good the enclosure should be, how much insulation to add, how much air tightness to add. Then we do a, what's called a load calculation to figure out how many BTUs per hour your air conditioner needs to suck or how many BTUs per hour your heater needs to add, um, depending on the season. The problem with all of that is that the weather is changing. So when you do those calculations, you're depending on some consistency in the weather. The weather is not going to do the same thing every year. In fact, it's, I think that there's been record highs and record lows all over the world for the last couple of years. So we don't know what's going to happen. And that's the, the key to performance is I want to predict. It's predictive modeling and preventative maintenance kind of basically. And if I can't predict what the weather's going to do, then I can't have a passive system. The reason that those mechanical systems, the forced air systems or the boiler or the geothermal, whatever it is that you want to pick, and I don't, I don't really care what mechanical system you're talking about, is that it can deliver you more or less depending on what's needed. If you depend entirely on the sun, and I'll give you an example, I have a solar system. I have an active solar PV system, photovoltaic, that generates electricity. Right now, it is unplugged from my house because it's frankly a big pain in the butt. If the sun does not shine today, I get zero electricity from it. If the sun shines all day tomorrow, I can have all my electricity from it. But the fact that I have to depend on it uh, means that the first day you'll depend on it. Second day, once you realize it's totally undependable and it's not consistent, is you will go buy a thousand dollar Yamaha generator or Honda, they're both very, very quiet, which is important in here. And you will also uh, carry around gasoline with you everywhere. And you also will try to plug into the grid whenever possible. Right now I'm plugged into the grid. And yeah, it's more expensive than being off grid, but frankly, it's the consistency. And also batteries, we can get into a whole conversation about batteries, but I don't want to, to um, bore you guys. So I'd say um, in a tiny house on wheels, people ask me, can I have a thermal mass wall in a, or at least, like use passive um, heating and cooling? in a tiny house on wheels? And the answer is definitively no, you cannot do that. When it's on wheels, you are limited by weight. And to have a, a passive, to use passive solar gain so that the sun comes in your windows in the wintertime, it has to warm up something that then is going to be warm enough when the sun goes down and it's nighttime that it gives off heat all night long. That's the point of the passive solar um, kind of way of, of building. So you need a really dense, really big concrete brick um, mud wall in order to do that. You're not going to have that in a tiny house on wheels, no matter what. In general, in a tiny space, you're probably not going to have that either because you, you're just kind of trying to be more economical about everything and having this giant thermal mass wall when all you really need is a little bit of heating and cooling. Like right, right now, my air conditioning is running and it's drawing about 300 watts to do its job. 300 watts um, per hour is about a third of a kilowatt hour times 24. If it runs all day long, 24 hours a day, which is highly unlikely, but let's just say it's super hot outside, runs 24 hours a day, that's eight kilowatt hours. A kilowatt hour costs me about 10 cents. So I'm running 80 cents is what it costs me to run this thing a day. I'm just not going to argue with that. It's so easy for me to, to modify it, to change what it's doing uh, on a daily basis. I don't have to depend on the sun. That is the way to go, in my opinion. So I think that, I hope that that helps kind of answer the question, but I think it's, it's for me, it's all about consistency. It's about knowing what to expect from your building. And if you're depending on the weather to run your building, that's very risky, in my opinion, because it's, you don't know what's going to happen. They say that Chicago is going to have Baton Rouge's climate in a hundred years. I don't know, but I do know that record temperatures are being set all over the place and stuff is, stuff is going down. So I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I'm about to build a house that's going to be a hundred year life span. I hope before it needs any kind of major work, um, so that my kids can live in it. And I don't know 
if the world is going to be around in a hundred years, you know, like I'm, I hope, but sometimes I feel like, I, I think that people have always felt like it's the end um, as we go, but uh, let's see. So I don't have any more questions up right now. I'm happy to talk about whatever it is that you guys want to know about. Let me go back through these and see. Um, those trolls are hilarious. I don't know if anybody who's watching this later can see these ridiculous um, comments that these douchebags were posting. Uh, let's see. Okay. All right. We've got some, um, but anyway, there, if you weren't here at the time of the recording of this, then I apologize that you're not going to be able to see this magic. All right. So we see creative experiments says people don't believe me that you can heat and cool tiny spaces easily. What do you think about humid environments like Hawaii? Well, I would say that there are humid environments everywhere. Um, I lived in Chicago for 15 years and for sure it got humid there and you don't want to, you don't want to take lightly the stuff that moisture can do for a couple of reasons. Number one is once you start growing some mold or some mildew, that's not, that's not good. Um, also when it gets wetter inside of a, a house, um, all kinds of chemicals get sucked out of your materials, your carpets, your rugs, your couches, chairs, uh, et cetera, even off of hard surfaces. So you're going to get all kinds of funky smells going on. And that is not what, where performance is at. Um, I would say it is easy. I would say in general, what I see tiny housers doing around the country when we were on tour, they would sometimes like have us come and do a day on the proof is possible tour and do our workshops and our tours and stuff like that. And then while we're at it, we'll just get a couple other tiny houses to be here. In my opinion, that was a, a mistake in many cases because my job is to say most tiny houses don't are not built to do anything like what ours is built to. And just a reminder, I've never built a house before. This is the first thing I ever built. So it's not hard. It's not rocket science. You do have to think about things. So I had one place that we stopped. They said, we're not going to install ductless mini splits until it's proven that um, it can withstand road wear. And everybody in the audience looks slowly over at my house. It's got a duckless mini split mounted on it and has traveled like 6,000 miles at that point. And yeah, I think we proved it. So mine is still running perfectly. I've never had to mess with the refrigerator or anything like that. Um, but those window units, number one, draw a huge amount of electricity. They are wildly inefficient. So you can't be off grid at that point. That's why everybody has 30 amp, 50 amp service in a tiny house on wheels or in a tiny house. I have 15 amp service in this house. And you can run everything in here on that 15 amps at 120. I converted up to 240, so it's seven and a half amps in reality. But um, I don't need a giant plug to be able to go. You know, I, ha I now have to go to an RV park because they're the only ones that have 50 amp service or 30 amp service. Can't park in somebody's driveway. So all that stuff, I think, is why I didn't want to go with the conventional cheap way of doing things that a lot of tiny houses uh, go for. Also, heat-wise, <coughs> if you're not using... <laughs> a ductless mini split, which can run down to like 1200 BTUs in heating mode. You've got one of those gas heaters or an electric heater, electric heaters, wildly inefficient. Again, I have to have 30 amp, 50 amp service in order to really do that well. Um, and gas heaters, I'm not going to run overnight while I'm sleeping. And also they are like 9,000 or 13,000 BTUs. And that's all they do. They're on or off. So you're going to run that. It's going to heat up the house like crazy. Then you're going to open all the windows. You're going to turn it off, go to bed, close the windows up before you do that. But the house is still going to like slide like crazy. You're going to have these crazy ups and downs in your house every day. And it's just, I think that it is easy. You're right. But I think that the application of how, what product you choose, what system you choose in order to do that, the television likes to make you think it's very easy. All you have to do is go to a big box store and buy something off the shelf and like, Nope, absolutely not. That's a lie actually. Or they don't know what they're talking about either, which is bad. Um, so humid environments, I would say every single, a lot of people will agree. Actually, I, apparently the guy who wrote the latest version of manual J Hank Rutkowski said in a session, every house should have a dehumidification system, a, a dedicated dehumidifier. And I actually believe that as well, because you just don't know what's going to happen. If somebody, you know, you're, your rug gets soaked, 
or somebody decides to line dry laundry in the house, it could have lasting effects because what happens with humidity is, um, so here's my house. It's under stasis. I've got 70 degrees outside, 50% relative humidity. Inside it's 70 degrees, 50% relative humidity in my air. And then there's also all my stuff. Let's just say that it sits at that level perfectly for a week. Now I have the opportunity for the outside air, the inside air, and the inside materials to all equalize and have the exact same uh, moisture levels. All of a sudden, something spikes outside. So now I'm at 100% relative humidity, it starts raining, and it gets to be 95 degrees outside, right? So now I've got this really hot air that's really soaking wet, and I bring it inside. And even when I dry it out with the outgoing air and the ERV core, it's still going to be real high humidity, 80%. Let's say, because I'm cooling it down to 70 degrees also, right? So now I have really high humidity, and that might only last for a day. And then it goes back to being a dry outside. But what happens inside is the air gets really, really moist. My dehumidifier works its ass off trying to get this thing to be um, you know, more dry. And while the dehumidifier is, is sucking air, uh, water out of the air, all of my stuff, all the soft materials in the house are also absorbing little bits of moisture and all the hard materials like this right here would get a film of one molecule deep of moisture on it. So now when the air dries out in the house, all the stuff rehumidifies the air with that moisture that's coming from the stuff. So this is one of those things, and there's a building performance podcast about this with Lou Harriman. You should listen to it if you haven't already. But that, that idea of the interaction between stuff and air is what, what are you trying to dry is very important because warming up the surfaces in your house, warming up the air in your house, those are two kind of different things. Like a, a radiant system does one, forced air system does the other. And there's a an interaction there where it, then it warms the other component. But that interaction is something that really people should pay attention to. Uh, let's see. The fantasies of uh, being decentralized as a human are just not there yet, maybe. Yeah, I think so. Also, you know what? Let me say this. So I don't know whether I'm talking to Gabriella or Joshua, but um, I think that part of the issue with the reason that we're going to need buildings to be built the way that they are with mechanical systems, with these engines that are more and more sophisticated and can deal with things and equalize the dynamics in the house is that we expect so much. Uh, if somebody does live in Hawaii, like, by the way, I have a friend named Blake. Blake Reed lives in Hawaii. Um, he is a high performance guy, but he's also the kind of guy who is happy if it's 60 degrees to put on a jacket. Um, a lot of Americans do not want to change their clothes depending on any environmental factors. They want to be able to wear their, you know, nice suit outside. And if they start sweating, uh oh, this is bad. Like I got to get inside again into air conditioning. So the idea that we can adapt to the weather so that then we can let the weather adapt us as well, this like kind of, you know, push pull relationship with the weather could totally be a real thing. In fact, people, I mean, people lived without centralized systems for millennia before we had all this stuff. But I would say that now we probably expect too much and we're a little bit too um, snooty to deal with like, oh, well, the sun isn't shining, so I can't have my electricity. What really you do if you are really off grid, which we have been in the past, is you don't do things in your house. If the sun is not shining today, I am not going to um, take a shower because that will run the pump, which costs electricity. I'm not going to turn on any lights. I'm going to go outside. Uh, we're going to go to bed early, right? Because we don't want to turn on lights. I, there's all kinds of stuff that you adapt to if you have to. Once I can plug into the grid, now I can do whatever I want. We're going to watch Netflix whenever we feel like it, not just when the sun is shining. Uh, let's see. JC says, is lower humidity in crawl space a byproduct of me sealing up the attic? Ooh. Very interesting question. Um, they are linked. Yes, is a short answer. But I think that I would need to know a lot more about that. I'll tell you that my dad and I are working on his crawl space, which is right behind our house. That counts as kind of a small space. Their house is, I don't know, 1,500 square feet, and that's all. So they have a crawl space underneath it that's only I don't know, three feet tall at the shortest and probably four or five feet tall at the highest. And we're, we just turned it into a bathtub. So we, we installed 20 mil plastic taped at all the seams, taped to all the piers that are holding up everything, even run under the, the furnace. You'll see videos about this on the YouTube channel soon, but 
um, the, the humidity down there has dropped tremendously and it's hanging on to all the air conditioning that's leaking out because the ducts are in the crawl space. So if you have ducts in the crawl space, that might be a different relationship that's, that's influencing what you're seeing there in, in that house. But yes, if you, the short answer is if you do anything to a house, it has effects on the entire system. So yeah, you could definitely seal the attic and have an effect felt in the crawl space as a result of that. Sub-Zero Home says, as daft as this sounds, why don't we insulate ourselves more with clothing rather than our homes? We have a 37.5 degree Celsius heater powered by food. Yes, that's a great point. And yeah, that would be great. There's actually this company that I learned about. Let me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so they're a German company that does energy modeling. They help architects, mainly this one architect that I was listening to, which is called Benish Architecten. They came over and did a presentation and they use TrendSolar, which is this company, this energy modeling company, to help them tune their buildings so that it's so that they can use as much passive as possible. And basically what they do is first ask what the target expectations of the client is. And to uh, Sub-Zero Homes point, this one case, they had um, environmental scientists, people who are used to going out into nature and sitting for weeks at a time next to instruments and like watching ducks and watching water and, you know, taking measurements of air and foliage and things like that. These people are used to being outside. So they actually designed a building that would drift a lot faster with the weather. This house that I'm in right now drifts hardly at all. It's like a ship that is very hard to steer. So once it gets really humid in here, it's hard for me to get it back on track because everything gets, it's just the systems are very small because it's very elegant and very efficient. So in this case, they had a lot of open windows. They had a lot of open decentralized, as Joshua and Gabriella were, were saying, um, floor plans. They had like little pods, but then the main area where you would work was this outdoor enclosed covered space where you could wear your parka and work and that's fine. And then they're like outside where they want to be anyway. It was kind of an interesting process, but yes, I agree with you. If we used clothes more than building insulation, that would be great. It's probably not going to happen for in my lifetime because people like I, you know, again, are too snooty. Uh, Sub zero says, okay, we need hot water too. Why don't we, we don't, uh, we just don't want to add layers of clothing whilst we're inside. It's okay when outside, just not inside. Yeah, right. I mean, I think that the, the joke with architects is that you've got clients now who want to have wall-to-wall -wall windows, and they also want to be able to walk around in their boxer shorts in every part of their house or their underwear. So yeah, we're a little like, I don't know whether those people are exhibitionists or whether they just want to be like perfectly comfortable and not have any clothes on because they're not in public and they can be slobs. That's either way, it's um, the same, same diff. Creative Experiment says, interesting, if a permanent dehumidifier is used, automatically activate above a certain percent, which is what mine does, yes. Would it need a permanent connection to the drain? Great question. So this one right here does not have a permanent connection to the drain. I actually will take this out. This is my water. And I will dump this into my Berkey and we drink it. Um, if the Berkey filters, uh, so this is, I, I showed this earlier, but that's where, is where we drink the water that comes out of the air here, which I think is a very cool, elegant, eco way of doing things. Um, not eco like save the planet, just like, that's sexy. So I like that. Um, I will say though, that I have another one of those machines in my dry vault, which is the world's highest performance tool shed. And that does have a permanent connection outside. And it was very easy to do. It's just a pipe. You know, not a pipe, but a hose that goes back and like it's it's actually pre-wired for that. So you can use either the drain pan or use a permanent connection. And in either case, uh, like I said, easy, very easy to do. Oh, by the way, this thing is a desiccant dehumidifier. The reason that I have that in the house is that it's very quiet. It does not have a compressor. The reason I have it in the dry vault is not for quiet because I don't care how loud it is down there. What I care about there is that it'll dry even down at lower temperatures. If it's 30 degrees outside, if it's 30 degrees for a week, it'll be 30 degrees inside that dry vault too, because it just drifts. So like, it, you know, the temperature drops, dry vault starts doing this because it's just insulated. It's not totally barriered. So once it gets down to 30, I still want it to be drying out the air. I don't want it being hundred percent humidity at any point. So that's why I use a desiccant dehumidifier in both cases. Uh, Sub-Zero Home says, I think we're split as a society. Uh, are we living in the golden age where the future inhabitants not have things as good as we do now? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I think, again, you need to protect your own family and pay attention to your own thing because it's, no one knows what's going to happen. And I can't influence, um, you know, a lot of what happens around the world. And 
I think that, and that's not me trying to be like, oh, I don't have any responsibility. Of course, you know, I like we're doing this webinar right now. I take my responsibility to the world very seriously, but don't worry about what you can't change. And like, I'm a humble person too. I know there's nothing that I can do about a million different things in the world. Um, Sub-Zero also adds, I guess there's a lot to learn from those who live in freezing countries. We don't require air conditioning here. Where, uh, what country do you live in, Sub-Zero? Um, Creative Experiment says, I was thinking about using more jackets too. They do make battery powered heated jackets now. Ooh, very interesting. So like an electrical heating element. And now we're getting into talks about like, well, how does that affect, like what needs to be warmed? By the way, this is interesting. You'll see in the home cam videos, but they've done um, at, at this home cam test site, which is University of Texas, uh, they did experiments on how air flows around your body. And it turns out that if I have something that's really toxic right here, it's not going to go directly into my nose because what turns out um, happens is that all of the air that I'm breathing that goes right out in front of my face is warmed by the warmth of my body. So I've got this sheet of air constantly running up my, my body and going off the top of my head. If you could see the air temperature, which is very hard to do, they, you can do that now um, with a camera with the, the tool, the technique that they use, but it's not infrared because infrared doesn't see anything but solids for the most part. Um, but basically we all look like candles. And so you could see this kind of thing. It's very, very interesting. So I think that what we're heating, like if you heat, you know, they've got the football thing now where if you're hot, you stick your hand in this thing and you wrap your hand around this cold bar and it cools your entire body off. So I think those kind of solutions, those are what I think is really interesting. The like jacket with a heater in it, I feel like is kind of like, well, it's, let's take a wheel and an axle and we'll make a bat and a, and a plate. And it's like, mm, is that the best real application for that? So um, by the way, Sub-Zero says that he lives in England, not freezing either. And he, you know, I think actually the people in freezing climates have a lot easier, like in Alaska or in Florida, where it's really, really hot all the time. They have it very simple because all they have to deal with is one season. I think that those of us who are in humid, which England, obviously, uh, and where the weather changes, where the sun doesn't shine 365 days a year like it does in Death Valley, those are where it's really interesting. And that's where the performance aspect of things gets really fascinating. So I love working on challenges in those climates. If it's something that has to do with the desert or with you know, Alaska or someplace where it's always the same and there's no air conditioning needed, or for example, in Africa, where they, they um, are able to build out of like somebody was telling me that in Kenya, they've got these buildings that are made with grass thatch roofs and solid mud uh, walls. And they're very cool because they're connected to the ground. They're basically like a heat sink and the sun shines down on the thatch roof and it doesn't warm up the inside because it's hard to get through all those layers with all the air bubbles in there. So I think that kind of thing is like, great. We should probably go back in, the, in that climate. They should not do what we do now. There is no need for them to have air conditioning unless they start building the way we do with skyscrapers with glass and the, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they want to have their Starbucks inside the lobby of the whatever. Like now we're mixing right now that we've taken like the invasive species from Japan and we brought it to Georgia and we think, oh, everything's going to be great, but it's not. Now we have to change a whole bunch of other stuff about this ecosystem just because we did that one change. Uh, let's see here. Electronics are everywhere in homes and they don't like moisture either. Yes, exactly. And by the way, EMF, I did test the EMF in this house because I started caring about that because we were going to buy a piece of land that had um, high voltage lines on it. And I found out that the two places where the magnetic field is highest is in my daughter's bed where her head is and when you're sitting on the toilet where your head is. And since we had lived here for a year when I tested that and none of us had shown any symptoms, I thought, okay, for my family, the EMF doesn't matter. We're coming up on one hour solid, guys. Um, so I'm gonna take uh, just one or two more questions. I have a question here that says, Iceland gets six months of sun and six months of dark. I have no idea how they build their houses. That is interesting. We should talk about that. Um, maybe we'll, uh, home diagnosis is hoping if everything goes well with the first season and then with the second season, that in the third season, we'll be going around the world looking at how people build houses and how they control home performance. So for those of you who are elsewhere in the, in the world, Please do let me know if you're interested in being part of something like that. That's like still a couple of years away, but I think it'd be really cool to meet um, those of you who are, you know, abroad. So yeah, six months of light and six months of dark, you cannot depend on the weather. At that point, you can't use thermal mass at all, right? Because you've got 
the, the amount of sun that you're going to get makes no sense. So now you really have to have machines to do this job for you because the, the world outside is not going to do it. If we lived in the 1600s and we were fairly willing to have heaters, coal heaters in our beds and um, heat up rocks and stuff like that and put them down by our feet under the covers and have no heat in the bedrooms and wear lots of blankets and wear the same clothes from Monday through Sunday, all that stuff could change the equation, but we're just not going to do that. Uh, oh, our trolls are back. Awesome. That's a great uh, cue for me to leave because I don't want to talk to that guy ever again. You guys have a great day. Please do check out the uh, consulting if you need any extra help with any of your time spaces. Um, check out the mastermind class that's coming up. I have another webinar that's coming up on August 1st there about that. Uh, and there's all kinds of other opportunities on the YouTube channel, on the website, go through the training portal, etc. You can get in contact with me very easily through the website. Thanks very much for coming out.